His bodily resurrection. This is the principal event of our very faith. There is no longer a sacrifice or atonement that we can offer God, that we can please God or provide to cover our sins. It has been done on the cross through Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 6 says, You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. So what's so good about Good Friday? Because from my point of view, what the Jewish and Roman authorities did to Jesus was definitely not good. You could see that in Matthew 26 through 27. Yet the results of his death are in fact very good. For Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this way. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So this begs the question, why did Jesus have to die? You see, the punishment for sin is death. The promise required death of a perfect and innocent man. And the prophets foretold of Jesus' death long before Jesus came down from heaven. So why did Jesus have to die? Well, God cannot let sin go unpunished. To bear our own sins would be to suffer God's judgment in the flames of hell. So praise God, the Lord Almighty, that he kept his promise to send a sacrifice, the perfect lamb to bear the sins of those who, who believe in him. Jesus had to die because he is the only one who could live a perfect, sinless life in order to pay the penalty of sin. In the Fox's Book of Martyrs, it says that there's a story of a man of God who was bound to the stake to die for his belief in Christ. There he was, calm and quiet, until his legs began to burn away. The bystanders looked to see his helpless body drop from the chains that had held him to the stake. His body black as coal and not a feature that could be discerned. But the one who was near was greatly surprised to see that this man, now burnt carcass, had opened his mouth and uttered two words. Sweet Jesus. And that man who was martyred for his faith in Jesus fell over his chains that bound him to the stake, and at last his life was gone. He was now in heaven with God the Father. No more pain, no more suffering. You see, the man in that story had the sweet presence of Jesus with him to help him through his suffering, through his pain. But Jesus did not have the sweet presence of his Father to help him on the cross. Instead, God the Father treated him as if he was the enemy, as the target of his righteous wrath. In this sense, the suffering of Jesus on the cross was so much worse than the way that martyr died. Spurgeon is quoted in saying that Jesus was the arch sufferer, the prince of sufferers, the emperor of the realm of agony, the Lord paramount in sorrow. You know little about grief. You do not know much. The hem of grief's garment is all you ever touch, but Christ wore it on his daily robe. We do but sip of the cup he drank to its bitterest remains. We feel just a little of the warmth of Nebuchadnezzar's furnace. He dwelt in the very midst of the fire. So today we're going to be in 1 Peter 3.18, a message I'm calling, Why Did Jesus Have to Die? Where we'll see why Jesus died once for all believers why he alone is the righteous one, and why it is finished. So let's read together in 1 Peter 3, 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, 
bring, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. The first thing we see here is that for Christ suffered once for our sins. It was the sins of mankind that is the reason why he died. From the very, very beginning in the Garden of Eden, when Satan deceived Eve and Adam willfully disobeyed God's explicit instructions, all because they wanted to know more as much as God does. And because of this very action, sin entered the world. And at that very moment when they bit the apple, the relationship between God and his creation was broken. It was the sins of mankind that Jesus died once for all. You see, mankind, we are sinful at our very hearts. We are guilty before God. We are guilty of disbelieving of God and his promises, of disobedience to the word of God, cursing God with our words and our actions, rebelling against God by living in unrepented sin, rejecting God and his ways. These are all sin, and the list could go on. You see, we violate the law of God, and when the law is broken, a penalty's got to be paid. We had to be judged. We had to bear the punishment for our own sins, which leads to the question, what is the judgment and punishment for breaking the law of God? It's simple. Death and eternal damnation. To be separated from God forever. You see, God is perfect. He is perfect in all ways and in all things. Because he is so holy, he cannot dwell in the presence of sin. He can't look upon sin. Therefore, only perfect beings can live in God's presence. This is the reason why we are doomed to death and to be eternally separated from God. Yet I got some good news for you. It's called the gospel. The declaration that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, that Jesus Christ took the sin of the world, that took our guilt upon himself before the judgment and the punishment for you and me. You see, it is only through Jesus that we can find ourselves perfect and blameless. You see, Jesus died once for me and you. He only had to do it one time. It's not a repetitive thing that happens over and over again. It's not something that needs to happen time and time again. Jesus literally bought every believer's sin at the price of his very own life. You see, the sin, the word sin here refers back to the Old Testament. The sin offering in Leviticus. The point is perfectly clear. Jesus offered himself up for sin. The fulfillment of sin offering itself was fulfilled in Jesus. And this means the most amazing thing for you and me. We now have become acceptable to God. We no longer stand guilty before God if we trust in him and his death on the cross. Sin and guilt have been removed and we have been declared righteous through Jesus Christ's blood on the cross. And in Jesus, we can extend, in Jesus, we stand acceptable and pleasing before God. 1 Corinthians 15.3 says, For I delivered to you as the first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. Galatians 1.4, Who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of God the Father. Revelation 1.5, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. We see it is through the blood, his atoning blood that we are covered, that we are cleansed, that we are freed from the bondage of sin. And only through his blood are we found righteous in the eyes of God. Which leads us to the next section of this verse. The righteous for the unrighteous, that he may bring us to God. You see, the dictionary defines righteousness as a behavior that is morally justified or right. 
Yet the Bible's de- definition of human righteousness is God's own per- perfection in every attribute, every attitude, and every behavior, and every word. Therefore, God's law, as given in the Bible, both describes his character and creates a plumb line which we can measure human righteousness. You see, only through Jesus Christ could he live perfectly by the law. It is only Jesus who lived perfectly. It is only Jesus who could fulfill the very law. Jesus was perfectly righteous. He was sinless. He led a sinless life. Therefore, he stood before God as one of the one and only perfect men. He is the perfect pattern of what every person should be. This means that Jesus was perfect in all ways. His righteousness covers every believer and makes him acceptable to God. It means that Jesus could become the perfect and only sin offering for us. You see, Jesus loves us and gave his life up for us. We deserve death and to be separated from God. For we are unjust and sinful at the very core. We are imperfect and not worthy of God's grace or mercy. Yet Jesus loves us. Therefore, he became the substitute who bore our sins and judgment and condemnation and punishment. So that when we believe in him, we never have to die and be separated from God. If we surrender our lives to Jesus, if we give ourselves over to his will, do we give ourselves over to his righteousness? Then he covers us through his death. He saves us from eternal damnation. And only through the death of Jesus Christ do we become acceptable and pleasing to God. We can always remember this because Jesus died for us. The just one Jesus Christ suffered and died for us, the unjust. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sakes he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 7.26, For it was indeed fitting that we have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. 1 Peter 1.19, But the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. 1 Peter 2.22, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Jesus died to bring us to God. It is our sin that separates and alienates us from God. It is sin that makes us imperfect and unacceptable sacrifices. Yet when Jesus took our sin and bore it on the cross, our sin was bought, invoice paid. It is because of Jesus Christ that we are declared righteous and our sins are no longer counted against us when we believe in him who saved us. We are only acceptable to God through Jesus and his death on the cross. We must cast ourselves, all that we are, our minds, our body, our soul, our past, our present, our future, we must cast that all onto Jesus. When we genuinely believe the work of Christ on the cross, God accepts us and allows Jesus' death to cover us. The sad fact is that not everyone believes in Jesus. Some say they believe, but there's no evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit in their life. In fact, most people curse and reject Jesus by their words and actions. Very few people even obey God and His Word. Few trust Jesus, and few, even more, have given their lives to him fully and completely. Seeing that Jesus did all this to bring us to God, how wrong is it for us 
not to come to God in the same way. To be willing to fully surrender to King Jesus. To surrender our wants, our will, and our time. Which leads us to the last section of this verse. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Because of our sin, Jesus with a tore up back, suffocating, mustered up enough energy to slide up a rugged wooden cross to say in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Lashamakani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's hard to realize that over 2,000 years ago, as Jesus was hanging there on the cross, that our sin and the sin of every believer that came before us, that is here today and that will come after us, Jesus took all that sin at that moment. It was laid upon his shoulders. You see, Jesus took the wrath of God for us. Because of that, his deep, intimate relationship with God the Father, that he was so close with for the 30 plus years that he walked this earth, at that time, Jesus felt so far away from his Father. He felt like he was forsaken by God. Because of his death, the spirit of every true believer is made alive in Jesus' suffering. And in that glorious day when it's time for us as believers to leave this world and go to live with God, God will transfer our spirit to heaven. And immediately your spirit will be perfected forever. And as true believers in Jesus, we will never again be subject to trials and tribulations of this corrupt world. Our spirit shall be perfect to live in the glory and majesty of God forever. We can be certain that the Father God approved Jesus' work on the cross. We can be certain that Jesus was innocent and had done nothing wrong to forfeit God's favor. Yet as the Father's own Son, nailed to the cross, holy, harmless, undefiled, perfect, sinless, and completely obedient to the Father, we can be 100% sure that the Father still loved him. With Jesus' second to last breath, he speaks the word tethalastai, a single word in Aramaic, translated into three words in English. It is finished. When Jesus uttered that word, he was declaring that the debt owed to his father was wiped away completely and forever. Not that Jesus wiped away any debt that he owed to the Father. Rather, Jesus eliminated the debt by mankind, the debt of sin. Dr. Pierre Barrette, a French surgeon, says this about the crucifixion that Jesus suffered. I had to edit certain parts due to the graphic nature, but he says this. After Jesus was arrested, he was questioned by Roman authorities all night. Early the next morning, battered, bruised, dehydrated, exhausted from a sleepless night, Jesus is taken to Pontius Pilate, where he is declared by the mob guilty, sentenced to crucifixion. The Roman legionnaire steps forward with a flagrum in his hand. This is a short whip consisting of several heavy leather straps with two small balls of lead attached near the ends of each. The heavy whip is brought down with force against and again and again across Jesus' back, shoulder, and legs. At first, the straps cut through the skin only. Then as the blows get continue, they cut deeper into open tissue, producing first bleeding from the capillaries and veins of the skin. Finally, arterial bleeding from the vessels and the underlying muscles. 
The small beads of lead first produce large, deep bruises, which are broken open by subsequent blows. Finally, the back, the skin of the back is so torn up, the entire area is unrecognizable. When it is determined that the centurion, by the centurion in charge, that the person is near death, the beating is finally stopped. The half-fainting Jesus is then untied and allowed to slump to the pavement, wet with his own blood. Flexible branches covered with long thorns are entwined into a shape of a crown, and this is pressed deep into the scalp. Again, there's copious amounts of bleeding, the scalp being one of the most vascular areas of the body. In spite of his efforts to walk standing straight up, the weight of the heavy wooden beam together with the shock produced blood loss is too much. He stumbles and falls. The rough wood of the beam gouges into the lacerated skin of the muscles in the shoulders. He tries to rise, but human muscles have been pushed beyond their endurance. The centurion, anxious to get on with the crucifixion, selects Simon of Cree to carry the cross. Jesus follows, still bleeding, sweating, the cold, clammy sweat of shock until the 650-yard journey from the fortress of Antonia to Gilgothal is complete. Simon then is ordered to place the cross on the ground, and Jesus is quickly thrown backwards with his shoulders against the wood. The legionnaire feels for the depression at the front of the wrist, and drives a heavy, square, raw iron nail through his wrist and deep into the wood. Quickly, he moves to the other side and repeats the action, being careful not to pull the arms too tightly, but allow some flexing in the movement. Now, the left foot is pressed backwards against the right foot, and with both feet extended, toes down, a nail is driven through the arch of each, leaving the knees moderately flexed. The victim is now crucified. At this point, the arms fatigue. Great waves of cramps sweep over the muscles, knotting them deep, relentless, throbbing pain. With these cramps comes the inability to push himself upwards, hanging by his arms, the chest muscles are paralyzed. Air can be drawn into the lungs but cannot be exhaled. Jesus fights to raise himself in order to get one short breath. Finally, carbon dioxide builds up in the lungs and in the bloodstream and the cramps partially subside. Sporadically, he's able to push himself upward to exhale, exhale and bring the life-giving oxygen back to his lungs. Jesus experienced hours of limitless pain, cycles of twisting, joint-rending cramps, intermittent partial asphyxia, searing pain where the tissue is torn from his lacerated back as he moves up and down against the rough timbers. Then another agony begins, a terrible crushing pain in his chest as the chest slowly fills with serum and begins to compress his heart. It is now almost over. The loss of tissue fluids has reached a critical level. The compressed heart is struggling to pump thick, heavy, sluggish blood into the tissue. The tortured lungs are making a frantic effort to grasp the small amount of air. The clearly dehydrated tissue sends their flood of stimuli to the brain. The body of Jesus is now in extremes and he can feel the chill of death creeping through his tissues. 
His mission of atonement has been complete. Finally, he can allow his body to die. With one last surge of energy and strength, he once again pushes his feet through against the, to- the nail, straightens his legs and takes a deep breath and utters the seventh and last cry. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Let's take a moment to think about how much Jesus suffered for us, what he went through for us, what we had to do because we are sinners. Let's take a moment of silence here. So what's so good about Good Friday? You have been rescued by a Savior. You have been healed by Jesus who walked among us. You have been given and declared righteous in God's eyes to spend eternity with God in heaven when you believe in Jesus Christ. You have been cleansed by his blood. You have been forgiven because he died for you. Jesus came down to walk from came down from heaven to walk with us to show us the way to help us walk the path of righteousness to be different than the world that surrounds us for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, I invite you to accept him. I invite you to speak to one of the pastors or their wives, myself or my wife. If you're not sure that you're going to heaven today, don't leave wondering. If you're not sure if you're going to spend eternity with God in heaven, don't walk out those doors without finding out. Accept Jesus today as your Lord and Savior and allow him to do the work that only he can do. Amen?